Hello, um, my name is Kurt and I'm here to give a brief uh, introduction on Gibbs sampling for motive finding. Uh, Gibbs sampling for motive finding is uh, done for usually for bioinformatics to search for sequence motives. Um, what are motives? Uh, this, these are some examples of motifs. Uh, usually in your D DNA sequence, there are some patterns that uh, tend to repeat themselves. Uh, for instance, here at the top bar here, uh, these sequences here uh, are representative of the sequences that correspond to binding sites that uh, signal transcription of DNA uh, so that the DNA eventually becomes translated into proteins. So if you have these sequences here, uh, these sequences uh, or motifs, they tend to uh, become target sites for binding of some other proteins and when, when these uh, so-called transcriptor fac transcription factors bind to these uh, motive sequences, then it signals the that the DNA following these regions uh, should be translated into proteins. So these motives, for instance, they say that uh, this is at this at this sequence positions you have a lot of uh, this position here minus seven from a certain uh, origin here has has a consensus. Uh, residue of uh, T followed by G followed by T followed by G followed by A of course there's some noises like not all sequences uh, at this position here will have uh, all T's but most of them will have capital R uh, will have the T followed by the G followed by the T followed by the G and followed by the A some motifs will have some variations but uh, more or less you would have this consensus motif. So there are different motifs for different types of uh, DNA sequences. Uh, so this is uh, one motif for a transcription factor and then this is another uh, motif here. So maybe this is another uh, motif for a different, trans uh, different transcription target site for a different set of proteins. So in the DNA sequence, you have a lot of uh, you have a lot of motifs, and detecting these motifs, if they exist at all, is uh, quite a challenge for bioinformatics. So one of the methods used for uh, for motif detection or identification is the Gibbs sampling method. Uh, it was originally described in by a paper of Lawrence. Uh, in 1993 and it was published in the science uh, journal so let's give an example so that uh, to see how this gives motif work gives sampling uh, for motif finding works uh, it's easier to understand the algorithms through some examples so for instance we have four sequences here and we suppose that each of these sequences contain the motif uh, Gataka uh, from the movie Gataka, uh, but we don't know where the where this motif is located in each of these sequences. So again, uh, this motif this motif Gataka may exist as it is in each of these sequences, or they may exist uh, like the consensus sequence, but with some kind of variation as shown previously, like for instance, even though the consensus sequence is T, G, T, G, A, others might have C, G, T, G, A, or some other uh, variation of the consensus sequence. So we're trying to find the, the motif Gataka in each of these sequence, but uh, take note that even though uh, the, the, the Gataka motif may exist in a slightly different uh, variation, from the consensus Gataka sequence. So how does the Gibbs sampling work? First we choose a 
we, we choose a sequence uh, for sampling. Uh, so uh, for simplicity, we start with the first sequence for sampling. Uh, when we say for sampling, what we do here is uh, we try to isolate the sequence first, and then we build uh, we build some probabilistic data uh, based on the remaining sequences. So here we we choose the sequence here, so we isolate it first, and then we build uh, probabilistic data on the remaining sequences. So here uh, we chose the sequence. And then using the remaining sequences that were unchosen, uh, we choose random motif positions. Remember, we're trying to find the Gataka position, uh, but we don't know where the Gataka motif uh, is in each of these sequences. So initially, uh, after choosing the, this first sequence for sampling, uh, for the remaining sequences, uh, we choose a random position for the uh, motif. So, for instance, for this second sequence, we say that uh, we choose randomly that the Gataka motif exists in this region over here. And then for the third sequence, we say uh, we randomly chose that the Gata se Gataka sequence is in this region here. And for the fourth one, we randomly chose that the Gataka sequence is in uh, the Gataka motif is in this region over here, highlighted by the, by the blue color. Okay, so now once we have all of the once we have all of the uh once we have chosen the uh the sequence for sampling in this case we chose the first sequence and then here we have the we chose random motifs positions for each of these uh remaining sequences or the unchosen sequences. The next thing we do is we try to build a table uh that tabulates the counts of the residues. So what does this table mean? Um, let's try to decipher the blue ones first. So here, uh, the Gataka motif has seven residues, G-A-T-T-A-C-A. -A -A. So you have seven uh, residues in the Gataka motif. So you have seven positions here, position one, position two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now, uh, for DNA, you only have four res possible residue identities. It's either ad adenine, symbolized by A, uh, cytosine, I think, uh, symbolized by C, and then guanine, uh, shorthand uh, here by G, and then you have thymine. So you only have four possible uh, residues for uh, DNA sequences. For proteins, you have more, so it's a little more complicated. So here, we're just... Uh, doing a simple example, we're trying it, trying the Gibbs uh, motif algorithm uh, through an example using a simple DNA uh, problem. So here uh, we tabulate the four uh, possible residues for DNA. Now here, uh, position one, we analyze the positions here, and then we count. Uh, so we first analyze the first position of the motif, the Gataka motif in each of the unchosen se sequences, and then we count uh, uh, how many times each residue occurs. So for the first position, for instance, how many times does the A residue occur? So we look here, one, two, three. Uh, none of them has an A in the first position, so we, we put zero here. And then similarly for C, we try to count how many Cs are there in the first position in each of the motifs in the unchosen sequences. And we notice that in the first position, none of them have a C, so it's a zero again. And then for the G here, uh, for these three unchosen sequences, notice that two of them actually have the G in the first position, so that's a two there. And then uh, the T, we have one of the we have one of it here, and so we put a one here. And then we re repeat the same pattern for the remaining positions. So, for instance, for position seven here, uh, we try to look at this is the position seven, uh, this one, this one, and this one, and we count the number of A's in the seventh position, and we notice that in uh, in the unchosen sequences none of them have an A in the seventh position, so we have a zero here. 
and then we count the number of C's uh, in the seventh position and we note that we have one C in the seventh position so you have a one there and then the number of G's is a zero and then the number of T's is actually two in the seventh position here and here so we have a two over there